<laughs> okay, well, today we are very honored to have Wolf Theater Storrel on the Plant Cutting Podcast. How are you today, Wolf? Yeah, pretty good. Sitting here in the cold on a mountain in near the Alps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're at, we're in central New York. It's pretty cold too, but I guess that's winter in the northern climes. Right, yeah. right. You're sure. It's good. It's good to have some rest, kind of. <laughs> yeah. The winter time for resting is always nice. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, it's a time to go inward, and uh, in the summer, it's a time to be out there, kind of like ecstatic, either gardening or yeah. being in the forest. Totally. So you have wandered the plant path for many, many miles, but we do have a traditional first question on the show, and it is, how did you come to the plant path? So probably way well, I think it started, maybe it started in, a, if you'd accepted in a previous life, uh-huh. so, I, sort of karmic. Yeah. Because I, as a little kid, and I was in East Germany, uh, back then when uh, during the time of the Russian occupation. Mm -hmm. And I just grew up in the family garden and roamed around and always had this uh, like intuitive relationship to the plants. I mean, they were not some objects, not distant. And all the time I could, I spent in the green and uh, yeah, uh, that that was what I did. And uh, then in the in the States, I went there when I was in the fifth grade. Well, nature just fascinated me. In Ohio, I mean, there are lots more plants and flowers of flowers in the springtime. It's wonderful. And uh, I found myself more at home in a forest uh, than playing baseball or any of that stuff. And they thought I was kind of weird. they didn't know what to make of me. And I, I and I love climbing trees. And I wanted to learn the names of these plants, because yeah. they, I, mean, I had close relation to them. And uh, my school teachers, they, they, uh, they said, Well, that's not interesting. That's not that's just weeds and scrubs. They didn't know the plants. And for them, science was uh, test tubes and, and Petri dishes and stuff like that. And so I started saving my money because I wanted to know what the plants were called, because that's important, the name of a plant. Hmm. And uh, so I went to Ohio State University. And yeah, it was great disappointment, botany and stuff, uh, because plants were really then objects. And I looked into the experimental gardens and these plants looked so unhappy. And the professors had no idea that plants could be unhappy. So after one year, well, one day, a uh, professor asked, uh, well, uh, what, why do plants have roots? And I says, because they want to, they want to uh, take up water and minerals. And he really flipped out. He said, that's teleology. They cannot want anything. That's, those are just mechanical processes. They soak it up by capillary action and... Uh, Yeah, and uh, do you think that a sponge wants to soak up water? And man, he really put me down. And that was the end of of my botany studies. And I'm glad I quit because it would have blocked me off from uh, this living uh, communication with the plants. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, I can't hear you. Can you? Here we go. Yeah. Sorry, I. I oh, okay. Myself, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And um, I was going to ask. So, what did you do after you quit botany school? Well, it was kind of a kind of a crisis for me, because um, that's what I had wanted to do, and so I hitchhiked down to Mexico and uh, went to the West Coast and. And then I decided, well, I'll go back and wanted to do geology, you know, dinosaurs and stuff. Yeah. And it turned out turned out to be mainly physics and oil geology. And so it was a big crisis. And then I found myself again uh, with anthropology mm-hmm. and especially 
uh, a friend of mine had a book about Neanderthals and Paleolithic people and hunters and gatherers, and that excited me. And so I became a um, anthropologist and did the whole thing. Became a anthropology assistant and an instructor at uh, Kent State University, and uh, I loved it. But in the course of time, I realized there were very few anthropological studies of uh, the use of plants. Yeah. Ethnobotany was not a subject. Huh. Uh, human relationships and social uh, order and all that stuff. But so I came back to the plants through the back door. And it always interested me what people did with plants and what plants mean and how they see plants. They don't see it as, let's say, in India or Native Americans. They don't see the plants as we do in academia. Plants are not just living beings, but in an expanded uh, consciousness, you can start communicating with them. Yeah. And uh, for... The Indians, I, I mean, uh, here in India, uh, generally plants are very high beings. They are in total meditation, and they meditate the sun. They meditate the sound of the sun, the yeah. OM that radiates down and take it up with all their leaves mm -hmm. and uh, transform that into life. And it's a life that enables all of us to live, uh, pl uh, the animals and us humans and even the fungi. And uh, they gave us, they have given us the air we breathe. We couldn't live without plants. And they have given us a blue sky because they have uh, oxygenated the uh, atmosphere. And they gave, give us uh, yeah, clothes and housing and a very important healing. Uh, and uh, yeah, and in anthropology, that's generally ignored because we have a paradigm that says plants are lower life. Right. And, you know, we're not as developed as most animals. And then, of course, not as human beings. So there we can do with them what we want. That's not the case in, in India. They are highly meditative being. They're like yogis and yoginis that are sitting there and just meditating the light of the cosmos, the light of the sun, and transforming it into life that so we can live. Yeah. Yeah, that's an amazing view. I mean, and it seems so natural to me, but it's it's hard to access that when you're you brought up in this like scientific reductionist. Yeah mentality where it's everything is just resources to exploit their non-entity right. that's why we, we you know we're at the top you know <laughs> everything else right. serves uh, us what a great illusion <laughs> yeah and uh, when i grew up in ohio uh i was always out in the woods like i said but there was no literature mm -hmm. uh neither in the school nor in the uh bookshops because who would buy books on uh, on plants? Uh, how boring. I did find one book, uh, a guy named Spencer, some professor somewhere. Uh, he uh, had a book on weeds, and the main focus was how to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> how to, like dandelions in the lawn, or even worse, on a golf course, well, you have to get rid of them. So which chemicals you use? But at least in that way, I could learn some of the names. And very important for me was the Boy Scout manual. Ah, I was yeah. for a while, it's Boy Scouts uh, kind of was into that. Uh, and uh, there were the plants uh, you could eat for survival. And I just soaked that up and I learned that by heart and uh, went around trying, uh, eating the, the plants. And just recently I visited in Ohio an old friend of mine, one of very good friends. And he says, we were sure you were, you were going to kill or poison yourself. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the pawpaws, which I loved, you know, yeah. in the woods. And uh I gave them, I gave him a uh, pawpaw to eat, and I said, isn't it wonderful and delicious? And um, 
This time he confessed. He kind of pretended that he ate it and threw it away because he was sure he was going to be poisoned. God. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, that's alienation from nature, you know? Yeah, uh, it absolutely. really is. It's so sad. And I guess at that, at that time, it was like kind of after, uh, like, I feel like in the, in the early 20th century, there was still a lot of like eclectic herbalism and there was still stuff happening. And then, but that, that period, there was a really a, like the medical, the medical establishment cut, kicked out yeah. all the herbalists there was no talking of plants right that's uh, yeah but it, well, you, still, you still are able to to just go directly to the plants and like right well there's no money in it yeah. if you say follow the money i mean basically uh herbalists are not they're 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 not good for the economy right <laughs> what yeah what happens if you yeah you got a uh, little bit of liver problem, drank too much or some, and then you go out and get yourself some dandelions. There's nothing better. Or a uh, goldenrod yeah. is one of the very, very best for the uh, kidneys. Hmm. And uh, I went, yeah, some years ago, I went to Chicago. There was only one herbal store. And on the bottles, it was just the name of the plant. And I says, well, how about dosage and when it was collected? And no, no, that's all illegal. And I says, well, how are people supposed to know? He said, well, you have books to do that. Right. But uh, that's really a repression of wisdom or knowledge that goes back for thousands of years. It goes back to Paleolithic times, really. Yeah. yeah. You talk about that in one of your books, which I think is really amazing. But this actually leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you because having grown up in the United States and like that's my where I, you know that's my context, um, that's what I'm used to is like herbalism is illegal. But like yeah. you traveled all over and like you know you live in in, in Germany. You it, how how different is it there as far as that? well in Germany there still is a pretty good tradition in Europe, but uh, especially in Central Europe, Switzerland, Austria, and so on. Um, where people rely on plants uh, a lot. And, um, but there is at the time a lot of pressure to uh, uh, go to clean, scientifically, scientifically proven uh, through killing rats in laboratories. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's under attack, but everywhere in the world that I have been uh, plants are the mainstay of uh, being healthy, of uh, treating uh, illnesses. And what we are in the, in the Western world, yeah, with chemical medicines, uh, you know, they, are, they have more side effects. And people say, well, they haven't been uh, studied enough. No, there are thousands of years of, of uh, experience behind that. Yeah. And then, sure. you know, the people who are paying for the studies don't want <laughs> don't want you to be able to heal yourself with just common outdoor plant, you know, plants you can find in your lawn. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, I lived in Wyoming and uh, uh, there was a magazine It's called Living Today or something. At every cash register uh, where you go out, you could see that. And they had uh, an article, Our Plant Safe, by some professor, doctor, doctor, so-and-so from university. Uh, and he says, are plants safe? Well, we have really no scientific experiments uh, to prove it, but we are very interested in plants. And so tell us, uh, had the address, of all the adverse effects you have so we can warn others about it. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> not any of the beneficial effects, yeah. right? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> well, that's that's considered superstition, yeah. Yeah, mm. it's like the progress-oriented yeah. Western society is actually so backward. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's limited, it's reductionistic, yeah, because it doesn't allow for, um, yeah, experiences or visions beyond very narrow. Uh, natural, in very narrow natural scientific method, which concentrates on uh, what you can, yeah, uh, weigh and measure and so on. You know, 
Yeah. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So after you uh, started studying anthropology, how did you get into uh, biodynamics? One of the books that we have of yours is the hmm. is this culture and horticulture. It's like right. a very old copy. All the pages are falling out. It's a water damaged. But our, our intern. Oh, yeah. I made a I made a case for it. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> old school. Um, but it's it's a classic on biodynamics, and biodynamics isn't something right. talked too much about. But it's such an interesting uh, field. I mean, um, like Steiner. I mean, I, I'm I'm really interested in like in Western esotericism, and Steiner is a giant of of. You got it right. But so how did I you agree? Get into- how did I get into it? Yeah. Biodynamics. Bio- well. <clears throat> Uh, that was 1970. <clears throat> I decided to do, uh, I was at Kent State University. I decided to do the year abroad. Mm. And uh, since I could speak German somewhat, I decided to go to Vienna and do a postgraduate study. Mm. And so I went there and I was going to write a dissertation. And I found, and I was specialized on small uh, communities. And then I came across uh, a community in Switzerland in, uh, uh, near Geneva and uh, decided to go there uh, disguised or as a, as a, a gardener and I was going to study them. And what happened is I found out all of a sudden a world I had never heard of like Steiners, you know, with etheric beings and astral influences. And uh, that fascinated me. So I, I stopped going or I, I went ever less to the university. <laughs> I should have been there like every, every month, at University of Bern, or at least every two weeks. And then it was uh, three months, and then I finally quit. My hair started growing. I walked barefoot, and uh, I could see connections. Like, and the same day, the farmer, our farmer, uh, let the cows in the spring out out on the pasture. The little ants uh, took the the plant lice up on the uh, elderberry bush, like taking their little ant. Uh, uh, cows out and uh, all these wonderful connections and I really got into gardening and it was like uh, it vibrated I got into resonance with it it was not any objective doings it was like uh, it was hard work but it was like dancing with nature oh. and I had some friends come from the University of Bern to see what I was doing and uh, I I didn't want to uh, disturbed the atmosphere by talking too much and I took him around and I pointed out a little bug that walked every day there a little path and and the flowers and so on Uh, maybe after an hour then they left and he said god I don't see how you can stand it this is real boring (laughs) yeah and no scientific explanations yeah it was like uh, being in resonance with these plants and it was so I noticed that uh, the plants communicate and tell you, hey, we need some water or or this or that. Yeah. So uh, after I left that place, I dreamt of that garden every day and knew exactly what was growing, what ought to be done. For a whole year, I dreamt. Wow. I was still connected with that garden. Wow. And that is, uh, yeah, I, en- I enjoy this. Uh, resonance with the uh, nature yeah yeah that's beautiful yeah so um this this book came out well the cop the on here it says 1979 right and that about that's about the same time that like bill mollison and david holmgren were like figuring out right. culture it seems like there was definitely something in the air then it was uh kind of the spirit of the time uh-huh. and i at this little college in Oregon, uh, I had a garden right next to the, not far from the campus. And the students looked at that and said, hey, man, can we learn? What are you, how, you, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I taught a course every Saturday for three hours. And that for three years, I did that. And the students asked me, well, um, 
are there is there literature no that that's uh, oral tradition and i've experienced that in switzerland also with uh, swiss mountain peasants and they said please give us the notes so we can uh, keep it you know and uh, so that's how it's actually the first book that i wrote i typed it on a little tiny typewriter and we stapled it together and i illustrated it with uh, my own drawings and it uh, and sold it for a dollar a piece i didn't want to make any profit but it became on the west coast an underground bestseller it was like everywhere and that was kind of the idea that uh, i wanted to share that with people Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's still in like community garden libraries and anarchist collectives and you know hippie yeah. communities for the u.s like you'll still see that book everywhere yeah 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 so have you noticed over that time frame of like what we're talking about in the 70s to now like what are the big changes that you've seen in the gardening and permaculture movement yeah well I learned from uh, actually a compost master. He was, uh, we had a two, two hectares. I don't know how many acres that is. I mean, that's a lot. It's yeah. like four or five or so acres or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And fed a community with uh, 150 people. And we took in, you know, mentally handicapped that uh, uh, helped us. And if they were real big and strong, well, they could turn the compost and they really did that well. Or we had a little uh, Monk Dow syndrome uh, character. Uh -huh. I don't know if these words are allowed to be said these days. Yeah, I think so. Okay. But uh, he made, he, he did best Satchmo um, Armstrong imitation. Oh, one of the seats go marching in. <laughs> and one day we had just spent a whole day uh, planting a field of. Uh, uh, cabbages with uh, interspaced with uh, lettuces and stuff. And at lunchtime, when we were taking lunch, he decided to work on and he uh, used the hoe and all the everything we had planted was gone. But <laughs> otherwise, yeah, it, was, it was real funny. And but we had a compost master and he said that is the uh, really, the, the guiding soul of the plant is the different compost. Yeah. And we had compost, uh, chicken compost or chicken uh, manure and uh, bird manure. And we realized that, that uh, where the animal eats, that's what it uh, basically um, fertilizes, like chickens with uh, grains and seeds, mm -hmm. pigs. We had real nice pigs every morning when we walked by the pigsty. They, oh, <laughs> and uh, we paired up. It's wonderful. And uh, we had them mainly just for their valuable manure because that's very potassium rich. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you compost it correctly, you get uh, wonderful. Uh, it's great for potatoes, root crops, and uh, and also, what is it called? Leeks. Yeah, uh -huh. leeks. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, sheep manure is great for increasing the etheric oils in plants. And cow manure is like an, for everything. It's uh -huh. really great. I could see why cows are sacred, basically. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what we uh, that's what we did. And. Um, I really haven't followed the trends okay, because yeah. I learned really good and thoroughly. I learned the biodynamic method yeah. and biodynamic doesn't just mean the preparations. They're good too. I, I came as a scientist and thought, man, that's a kind of weird stuff, you know, <laughs> little uh, tiny stuff and you put it into the compost or uh, this, yeah, this uh, horn, uh, silicium or kiesel, what is called a uh, preparation. It's like we ground up yeah. mountain crystals, stuffed them in cow horns, and then used a little bit, put it into a, a, a 
Yeah, uh, like a huge vessel and with a birch broom, stirred it in one way to make a funnel and then whoosh, turned it around. The idea is cosmos, chaos, cosmos, chaos. <laughs> uh, started spraying it and I thought, God, man, that's like medieval uh, superstition. Uh -huh. But then I, I did it myself as I was still anthropologically observant. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, uh, hey, it, actually, it changed my consciousness as I sprayed it. And I could see things meditatively. I could see little earthworms come out as though they said, hey, thank you. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, these are rituals. Uh, that's one part rituals uh, to connect you with the soil and with the plants mm -hmm. and it works yes, and it is not just like chemical fertilizer uh, that uh, just fertilizes there's another dimension to it yeah yeah, yeah. It, it really does seem like alchemy and like from, it is yeah from from one perspective from the scientific reductionist perspective that's backwards and you know <laughs> yeah. but i mean i mean alchemy is a real esoteric science you know yeah. yeah right and it's uh it ought to be like a gentle science one that uh communicates and interacts with nature it's not just this brutal hammer method like uh, what today glyphosates and yeah. is that the correct way of saying? i don't know terrible stuff yeah terrible stuff yeah <laughs> and i was shocked when i uh visited my folks in illinois of endless fields of uh, soya and corn and uh, no no weeds no associated plants it's like basically dead it's like a desert it is yeah. it shocked me yeah yeah it is shocking yeah it's yeah to drive through that part of the country is just yeah and all the across. all the family farms basically gone yeah mm -hmm. i thought that was bad yeah, around here in New York, it, the dairies, family dairies were the big thing, um, but those are pretty much all gone. It's just yeah, giant, yeah, giant barns filled with thousand cows, you know, yeah. and their manure becomes a waste product mm. instead of, oh, Jesus, you know, uh, mm. the, the, this beautiful compost for the Right, right, right. I hope uh, there'll be a trend in the other direction because that cannot be sustained. No, no, and it can no. and won't. I mean, it's all dependent on fossil fuels too, and as those are depleted. Oh yeah, right. But we'll right. see. How it goes. <laughs> we'll <laughs> see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who who were some of your your teachers and mentors? In this yeah. Uh, one was this uh, compost master uh, Stauffer. Mm. Uh, he just loved compost, and he had uh, his compost right next to the garden house where I ate meals, it was part of that family. And he had it right next uh, to the window, his huge compost, <laughs> and he'd be sitting there basically in meditation and he'd, uh, his nose would wiggle and he'd, oh, oh yes, uh, <laughs> nitrogen processes, oh, phosphorus process. Uh, he, that's what he said once in a while. It was very embarrassing to his wife when we had visitors. Uh, she'd do the talking and he'd be out, spaced out out there with his compost. And she said, Manfred, isn't that so? And he's, uh, oh, yes, Hilda, it is so. And then he was <laughs> back in his compost. I mean, he loved compost. Uh, we went, uh, it was the garden or the whole farm too, uh, was just uh, a glacial moraine to make basically stones, very little humus, and he built up the humus. He went to uh, barbers to get uh, hair to compost. Uh, we went to uh, Lake Geneva where they dredged the lake of algae and uh, gave the people, instead of dumping it at some dump, uh, gave the uh, truck drivers a case of beer and then they brought it to us and we composted that. Oh, and of course, that's part of biodynamics. You can't have um, a living farm organism without animals and uh, they because plants and animals belong together yeah even even so-called insects belong together uh, 
there was good studies in the 70s by Rodale, maybe, I don't know if that still exists, there was a, a organic gardening uh, uh, magazine and so on. And they had good studies showing that actually plants need insects to chew on them. And uh, if they eat more than 20% of the leaves, then they start reacting by uh, changing their metabolism and it doesn't taste good to them anymore. Or some uh, send out pheromones or uh, odors to attract uh, wasps and stuff. But it is important that the plants have their insects because these are like externalized, um, uh, yeah, um, externalized um, organs. Uh, no, what do you say? Um, uh, ducts. Ducts. Uh, yeah. 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 Right. They're part of the right part of the metabolism. They need the insect up to a certain point, and then it's too much. Right, because we, yeah. so we the scientific paradigm sees things as discrete entities that don't have an interrelation. But like, oh yeah, studying ecology and studying systems theory, you see, it's all interrelated. And it's all part of the same one being in a certain way. That's right. That is right. And the more differential it is, and less monoculture, the better. Like yeah. I have a garden here, and it's full of all kinds of insects and uh, snails, and you have it. But uh, I have a whole, I have lots of weeds, uh, nettles, in which, uh, yeah, salamanders and toads and, and little uh, running uh, bugs, uh, I, I don't know their names in English. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they keep it in good balance. And I always have flowers, some flowering plant, or I let the cabbages uh, uh, go to flower, and then I get uh, yeah, uh, flying insects and bees, and the whole thing is in harmony. And uh, yeah, I don't need and would never use any poisons or, or chemicals, yeah. Yeah, so your, your compost teacher, um, he taught you how to how to make compost, and there's something you talk about in in culture and horticulture, right. how it's it's fine to just compost in place and like mulch with compost, but when you create a compost pile, it's like you're creating a Paracelsian homunculus. You know, exactly. You get, there's a consciousness in a yeah. A, yeah. Like in each part yeah, of the yeah. creations make it part of the body uh, is a is a part of its body. Right. It's like uh, it's the way he saw it. It's like a primitive. A amorphous, undifferentiated body, a life, uh, like, uh, yeah, life. And th it has stages when you, after you put it together, it goes through a young thermal stage where it heats up and uh, it, uh, yeah, it gets rid of, through the heating, it gets rid of all sorts of pathogens and stuff. And then after that stage, the youth of the compost has passed. Then comes uh, then then come the uh, fungi, mycelia, and and so on, and they take hold of uh, the ammonia that is otherwise would go to the waste and capture that, turn it into uh, yeah protein uh, bodies, and then and then the earthworms come. And they digest it and make uh, this uh, very complex humus uh, molecule that is able to hold on to water and, and, is, and captures cations and anions. It, like, it becomes like a wonderful substance. And then you can uh, eventually put it on the, uh, in, into the garden uh, that is... Uh, for him, that was better than just spreading the stuff on the field or on the, uh, yeah, on the fields, uh, because um, uh, then too much nutrients would go up into the air. Mm, yeah. 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 And there seems to be like a, a sum that's greater of its parts because it does take more effort right. to make compost than to just, you know. Right. Right. But it's uh, it's worth it. Yeah. For him, it was really important. Uh, 
and he was glad I was there. By that time, I just left the university behind me. Uh, later on, I picked it up again. But uh, and uh, he, after one year, uh, I became the gardener doing order, uh, doing the organizing and doing so he could concentrate totally on the compost. That nice. was his. That was his. That was his thing. That's yeah. His passion. Yeah. Are there any other teachers and mentors that okay. you Okay. Then another teacher was very important. I was an old man who lived on a isolated mountain farm in the uh, Swiss Jura. Wow. And one in it uh and one it was uh, during Christmas time and we decided uh we'll do the whole 12 year uh, 12 days of Christmas. And uh because traditionally Christmas lasted 12 days, mm -hmm. just as midsummer, the summer solstice lasted 12 days. And uh, the summer solstice, a time of ecstasy, dancing, jumping over the midsummer fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, winter solstice, are like being in kind of be more mostly indoors, being meditative, you did only the necessary chores like milking the cows and uh, on Christmas Eve, we uh, even gave the cows uh, special food. The horses got oats and the chickens got uh, spaghetti and they loved it. And we sang Christmas songs to them. Aww. And the uh, next few days, the cows gave better milk or more milk. Uh, they were really happy. Hey. It was even, one even thought that the cows could, uh, or the animals could speak at Christmas in the mm. Christmas night. And one little, one kid, 15 year old, he says, oh, I want to check that out. Went into the barn, was going to listen if the cows or the animals could speak. Next morning, he came in the house and he, and the farmer said, well, did the cows and the animals speak? He says, no, I fell asleep, but I had a dream. And the uh, four heifers, the new ones, they, talked to me in a dream and they said they like the place here but they'd like to have some salt and the farmer says oh shucks i've forgotten to give them salt oh my <laughs> <can't gosh>. speak. <laughs> yeah. and these are these are mir miraculous things that can happen at the solstices yeah. so we decided to uh 12 days to just yeah meditate or do special courses and um the farmer knew of this old man he was over 80 years so 82 years old at the time and uh we invited him in uh, down and yeah he, he made people uh soul dolls and gave a course on eating and and told wonderful stories i expected uh some little old anthroposophic man that meditates in front of Steiner and starts looking like Steiner himself <laughs> with the beret. But this guy was like really strong, was like a bear. And he was strong and he lived on on this isolated mountain farm, had a couple of cows and a horse. And I was, and uh, yeah, he became a very important teacher to me. Like he uh, talked about in no abstract way, he talked about the spirituality of nature. And for him, the sun was uh, like uh, Christ in the soul. It was like, it was, uh, it was a God being. It was not a nuclear uh, plant racing through space, but it was like he was connected soul-wise with the sun and the earth was a mother earth and he could not understand people that couldn't see that this is the mother earth that... Uh, uh, feeds people and that uh, clothes all the souls into matter as a mother earth in that sense. Yeah, I learned a, a, a lot and he said our garden is, our huge garden, is a little bit too clean. You should leave some weeds, wow. you know, not clean it up, not in a total Swiss fashion. <laughs> and uh, because the weeds are like... Um, they, they, are, they have vitality, which they share with the other plants, with the cultivated plants. Some of them root very deep and bring up nutrients. And uh, yeah, when you hoe them, uh, they're good mulch. So uh, our garden became a little greener. 
but he was a very important teacher. Mm. That was a second important teacher in that respect. And the third one was when I went back to Wyoming, I was, uh, I'd been, we'd been in India and gone pretty wild and still had a beard and long hair and stuff. And it was kind of for the Wyomings, a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I got along best with uh, some wild free bikers who lived next door. And uh, they were having one of these real parties. The only word that they had is, uh, fuck this, fuck, man, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Just blank that out. <laughs> and and uh, they were having a big party, and I was hoeing my corn. I said, hey, look at that hippie hoeing his corn. And I, I took that as an invitation, and I got along real well with them. Nice. Uh, but they were real bikers, and they said, hey, man, where are your boots? And... Uh, I, I was barefoot. So <laughs> next time I put on my rubber boots and I was, hey, look here. This guy named Trash. He was a kind of the chieftain. <laughs> I, I said, hey, that's my boots here, rubber boots. But I got along real well with them. And then I got along well with the uh, Indians, the Cheyenne Indians, who had a reservation uh, right on the border of uh, Wyoming, north of Sheridan. And uh, I started. I, I started at the college, and I had, I taught medical anthropology. And what I did was uh, gather, not abstract, but I gathered uh, the plants that grew there in the big horns and in the prairie, and I brought them in, and let people smell them. Not just seeing and thinking about. Them. You have to smell them and taste some of them, and uh, feel them because every plant has another feel, and. In front of me uh, where was a pair, the woman with kind of like uh, uh, fancy hairdo and uh, uh, shoes with, you know, these, uh, with those heels, what do you call them? heels <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the man up tight in a suit, it looked like he had a noose around his neck with a tie. <laughs> and they looked, they were standing there looking at me. And then as I, as the uh, plants passed by, uh, they just went like, as though, ooh, there's something oh. terrible. And I said, what's wrong with these people? And one of the students says, that is the local head of the AMA. And he is here to check if you uh, give any receipts, uh, I, I mean, recipes for yeah. uh, healing. He'd uh, drag you in front of a court for illegal practice of medicine. Right. So the next day, next time we met, uh, I talked about planetary associations with plants. Nice. I was in a Renaissance real big and here for the herbalists here in the Alps. It's still important. So you can see the nettle is real Martian. It's like uh, it's like Mars, the warrior planet. And the uh, dandelion is Jupiter with its yellow uh, flower, uh, flowers and its association to the liver, which is the organ of Jupiter. And uh, I, as I was saying, I saw over their heads like a big question mark. What the <laughs> hell is he talking about? And they never came back. They thought, yeah, this is some kind of crazy and uh, he's not, he's not going to do anything bad. Yeah. Perfect. So that's, uh, and in the course of that, I met um, uh, the uh, medicine man, Bill Tallbull, mm. because a, a person I had association with a Cheyenne told them I was teaching that. And then she said, uh, uh, would you be prepared to uh, have a Cheyenne medicine man visit? And uh, we got along right away. It was like good friendship. Did a, He did a tobacco ceremony for greeting with a Marlboro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then we started for a year and a half, we started going in the big horns and in the, in the steppe, in the prairie, uh, looking at plants. And he was the, uh, of that tribe, he was the ambassador to the green people or the green folk. And those are the plants. And we met on that, on that level. And I really taught, got taught a lot because um, 
I was doing the normal Linnaean uh, plant identification, you know, counting the petals and the stamens and and so on and the position of plants. And he just stood there, folded his arms and said, what's this crazy vejo, this crazy white man doing? And then I noticed he does not talk about plants, he talks with plants. Now that took at least a half a year before I could get into that uh, and understand what he's talking about. And what he does is he gets, or what he did, he got into like another frame of consciousness, uh, in meditative frame of consciousness, and uh, communicated with the uh, spirit of the plants. And I learned that this was not just fantasy, childish behavior like one has been taught, but it was really uh, seeing that there's more to plants than just it's their their physical uh, uh, aspects. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and that's what I learned from him. That was uh, Bill Talbot. He's a very famous uh, medicine man. Yeah, yeah. So that so that was when you actually learned. I mean, it seems like you've always had this uh, uh, respect for plants and seeing them as as people, as entities yeah. with intelligence, but being able to actually communicate with them uh, is like another jump. One did. One one communicates with plants anyway, but one uh, doesn't have it in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I notice, uh, like, when I garden, uh, yeah, I'm in total communication with the plants and everything. And then, uh, and I, but I don't notice that it is so and then somebody yells hey dinner and so and i notice that my soul or the the fine feelers etheric antenna just can go back in because really one has been out there floating around with the plants but uh, not in any fantasy or esoteric way uh not just all oh, Oh, I'm an elf, and oh, it's wonderful. None of that, because that's been mainly ego. But you're really there connected. Most people have that ability. All people have that ability, but we've been uh, trained uh, to kind of put that to the side or consider that uh, weird or whatsoever. Uh, but uh, it, I think the sickness is this, uh, to constantly be in this uh objective manner the word object has been object to tune and that comes from the latin objectere that means thrown out there not connected in in reality experience or looking from the outside that's like uh, uh in human relations uh, when people love each other they don't make objects of each other either they enter into communion it's communion, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's harder to see uh, from the part of your mind that makes distinctions, like yeah. So, you, so it's it's so you're in it, but then you don't realize you're in it, and when you do realize in it, you're in it, you're out of it. <laughs> but that's right. That's <laughs> it. But the interesting paradox, right? Conscious about it to be to re- know you're in it and be in it. That to me seems like it takes a lot of skill. That takes a skill that is basically a shamanic skill. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, as an anthropologist, I've spent a lot of time uh, with um, shamans uh, or what, what are called shamans and medicine people. Like a medicine man, medicine woman is different than a shaman, but they can have shamanic uh, abilities. For the Indians, a medicine person is somebody who has that spiritual power so that things happen. Ah, yeah. Good things happen. Yeah. But uh, the shaman goes into these uh, worlds. It's not a clear distinction between them, but it is so. And he travels into these worlds. Uh, some crazies can do that, but they don't come back. They just stay out there somewhere. But a shaman is fully conscious and can bring these uh, messages back. And uh, it's very difficult to tell, mm, yeah, ordinary, normal people uh, what, for the shaman, what is experienced 
out there with the spirits of the plants, which are very far. When you're so far out with the plants uh, and you come back, you have to, then the dogs and cows and stuff, they first of all, hey, they're so close to humans. You have to, oh, oh yeah, okay, they're not quite human. Okay, and then you're human. <laughs> I mean, and and uh, Your people. How do you, how do you tell people what what spirits and what you have seen? You have to put it in language that they understand in pictures mm -hmm. and in fairy tale type of uh, communication. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, that's why shame, uh, real shamans are also masters of language and masters of, um, uh, yeah, tales and imagery and symbolism. Yeah, or like yeah. Odin, you know, he's the shamanic Norse god and he also... Yeah, he's absolute shaman. Yeah, he has the language. He, he taught the runes or he learned the runes. And You're right, 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 right. There's a combination right. yeah. between language and... right. And uh, yeah, work. So I'm interested in if from your perspective, um, like the Western occultism, esotericism that Steiner is a part of, do you see that as a, um, a type of shamanism or is it something else? Well, he has, uh, he has meditation techniques that are kind of borderline shamanism. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's really a visionary. He has uh, he has uh, the mad cow disease hundred years ago. Right. He he said if you start feeding uh, meat scraps, cows are going to go mad. For example, and he said, uh, yeah, at the at this time in history, um, there will be children born that uh, start having these natural. Uh, um, the visionary capabilities again. And he also said uh, that uh, we have to be careful well, um, because um, a lot of the, yeah, uh, as all immunizations and stuff are really blocking uh, the uh, communication with. Uh, the, the spirit world. Uh, no, he has he has uh, interesting and fantastic ideas, and one can uh, really find uh, uh, as a, a lot of people find uh, a meaning in life by following him, and it's good. I myself have spent ten years really studying Steiner and re oh man, it's hard to read him. You have to <laughs> you you have to take each sentence and basically meditated to get right, yeah. the thing. And uh, I've spent 10 years and um, it is now it's come to the point where I can say it was like a boat that took me across a river. Mm -hmm. And now I'm on the other side and I can leave this boat behind. Mm -hmm. And I go, uh, go now, but I'm very, very thankful to Steiner because he brought, he broke me out of uh, this very narrow uh, scientific uh, vision or mm. point of view. Yeah. 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 Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So uh, one other thing that you talked about um, with <laughs> those, uh, those doctors that g just got like big question marks over their head, the right. very and plant correspondences, do you still find that useful and like how have you determined those like for instance like do you use call pepper or are there other sources that you use or do i you use call pepper i respect him yeah yeah uh signatures and the like yeah. uh and planetary the planetary uh correspondences like call pepper does uh we don't that is such a complicated system yeah. paracelsus talks about it and we can't just say, well, okay, uh, here this uh, red flower is Mars, and uh, uh, yeah, this uh, evening primrose is uh, this uh, is, is Jupiter, and so on. That's too easily said. It is a very sophisticated system that most people nowadays don't really understand anymore, yeah. and one has to work into it. One has to get into this worldview, this vision 
um, of the earth and as the, I mean, I'll simplify, as the mother earth and the realm of the fixed stars as a realm of the archetypes. And part of the idea of this planetary uh, herbalism is the archetypes, uh, spiritual archetypes of plants, descend uh, the planetary spheres. That's like the, uh, the branches of a shamanic tree or the uh, Jacob's ladder. And, uh, and the furthest out planet is um, Saturn, and then is Jupiter, and then comes Mars, and then comes the um, ecliptic where the sun is, uh, goes. The sun is, as a moving body, is considered a planet in that way. And then comes uh, Venus, uh, Mercury, and then the moon, and then the earth. And when these archetypes come uh, come down the germs of the uh, plants, they are given gifts by each sphere, by each planet. And when they hit the Saturnic sphere, Saturn gives them kind of like bitterness and he gives them, um, he gives them like uh, hardness, salit. structure, Hard, like hardness or structure, you know, structure, hardness, exactly. The set, the Saturn sphere is actually the blue sky, oh. and that's why the, you talk about the blues, or uh, is like a yearning that is so far. That's oh. Afro Afro Americans that have been taken out of their homelands and their families and split up. I mean, you can't get more the blues, this yearning for something that has been taken from you. That's Saturn. And uh, Saturn is um, in life for humans, is old age and is clarity of spirit or is bitterness and ah, what is the worth of it? Yeah, shit, that thing. And so on. <laughs> it always has to, uh, it's, it's a complicated, it's a wonderful system. Then yeah. in June, Jupiter. Jupiter is yeah uh, the is the uh, uh, god of uh, yeah wealth, plenty of uh, uh, passion, passion of uh, intoxicating brews. Of uh, he is he's the king. Yeah, and Jupiter mm -hmm. is the king of the gods. Is yeah. he? And uh, and he he uh, uh, manifests in plants in that he makes. Uh, uh, wonderful fruits and oils and sugars and so on. And then it goes to Mars. Yeah, he's red like blood and he has spikes and thorns. And I mean, these are extremely complicated system and you have to sort of study it. I was happy to uh, meet Steiner because he knows that system, but not, mm, I mean, not totally. He just was pointing the way, and I got to Paracelsus. For him, it is absolutely important. Uh, the planets. He says you cannot be a good doctor if you don't know astrology, or in the true sense, not yeah. to hear what you read in a paper, Sunday paper, you know, right. your horoscope. But really, unless you know what planet, because uh, the organs, we are a microcosm. The organs are also uh, controlled or related to the planets. And then you have to find the corresponding plant and find out uh, the corresponding plant and the planets that are active there and bring them together. And it's a real, it's like nuclear physics to me, you know, but it's very interesting. And it's a functional working system. Yeah. Mm. So well, it doesn't have to do it, but it's just another view of the world. You can, yeah, you can go back to your chemicals and alkaloids and glucosides and so on. You can do that and you can do both. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. So you yeah. found it useful over the years, this yeah. uh, correspondences. Good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Because that's something that I'm, I've been studying too. And like, there's been lately a more um, movement towards uh, traditional astrology and like studying yeah. astrology, like William Lilly and Culpepper and going back even further. So, and that, right. that, 
that whole worldview. I mean, that's the first. Yeah, that it's a worldview. Yeah, you have to learn the it, world, otherwise it doesn't make any you sense. Know, you know, and Culpepper, uh, he uh, he wrote for people who knew this worldview. Yeah. Uh, he didn't have to explain it, really. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful idea. It's like not, not just the plants come from these fixed stars, the archetypes, uh, fixed stars that are uh, divided traditionally since the Sumerians into 12 regions, and then the planetary ladder and these whirl, swirl down, you know, in a kind of swirling motion. And, um, and then we go back, the right. plant, uh, it goes back to the, in the on the earth, it takes on material, it becomes matter, the plant, and then it, when it sprouts, and the dicotyledons uh, huh? uh, come up, then it's in the moon, and it's, uh, it's uh, very moist and so on and then when it just shoots up in the spring that is mercury and then when it starts flowering that's venus and when it flowers are fertilized and so on that's mars and then it goes to fruiting and that is uh, jupiter and then saturn is the seed and when you look at the uh, uh, dandelion when it has this crystalline form it's actually a picture of jupiter mm. uh, surely excuse me of of uh, saturn yeah. saturn when it's not jupiter yeah yeah it's just the seed it's this yeah. that's why saturn is always represented as an old man with a bag of seeds uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and yeah. then he takes you across back to the heavens the archetypes and then in the cycle it goes back and so on yeah that's yeah. interesting <laughs> He has the sickle, like, which harvests grain seeds. And you all know, harvests. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there is something I wanted to ask you about that. Um, I don't know that much about biodynamics. I haven't studied it yet. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I'm under the impression that he uses sidereal astrology. And I was wondering if you use sidereal or tropical. And uh, yeah. Uh, both. I mean, as far as, yeah, both. Uh, yeah. Sidereal, of course, in which position the uh, planets uh, find themselves, that's important. And uh, tropical, like the tropical moon is, uh, yeah, uh, the moon cycle. So, yeah, both. We use all of it. And it can become so complicated that you can get so confused that you never find a uh, perfect day in which to. Uh, sow your seeds or plant right yeah but you can't so, yeah. like maria toon i don't know if you heard of her she has a calendar for when to sow and when to plant stella and that, the stella pardon? is it the stella natura calendar i don't know what it's called in english it's called oh. this it's a calendar when you're supposed to do yeah. your garden work mm -hmm. and it depends on uh, where the uh, uh, where, where where the planets are in the uh, in this sign of the zodiac, and some are uh, fire signs and uh, water signs, air signs, and earth signs, and and so on. Well, we found out that uh, sometimes the weather is more important, or uh, yeah. a full moon, or or you just don't have time on in the perfect day and you'd never get your garden done if you only stick with that. Yeah. And I've uh, in, in Switzerland, I was on a mountain farm uh, in, in the Emmental uh, Valley. And um, yeah, the farmer really uh, was on that trip. And I noticed, I know the weather was going to change and we were uh, harvesting apples and he came out stop harvesting the fruit sign is, is passed uh yeah. now it's an earth sign and say well it's a bad weather coming no 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 maria toon says this and i said well too bad and the apple's froze the next day oh <laughs> well, good thing you got them huh yeah well yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you got some i guess yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so you got yeah but yeah, it's a one, one has to go with nature and not be fanatical as far as the charts and so on go. Totally. Yeah, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? 
Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Keep it going. So um, I'm also curious, I'm, I study herbalism and I think a lot of our listeners do as well. And so you're also an herbalist and I'm wondering how that came into the picture. Like, how did you get into the more like medicinal herbs and, you know, plants? Yeah, well, that's from way from the beginning. Uh, that was my grandmother was an herbalist and she uh, uh, did not only nat naturopathy mm -hmm. and uh, she really did well and that's what I learned yeah when we as kids had stomach ache or something she'd come with her chamomile tea yeah which grew chamomile from the garden mm -hmm. and uh and she, then she said it's very important that the word of the grandmother or of the healer the word is oh that'll that'll heal or oh that sickness you see it's already uh uh flying out the window mm -hmm. and uh and then a grandmother is like a little bit like a goddess it's, she tells a mother what to do mm -hmm. and uh, so you believe her and you really get well and she did all the healing with uh with herbs mm -hmm. she did not like going to the medical doctors because uh, no she, that is traditional that goes back till the uh to the old stone age that uh, the women took care of the family of the sick of the old of the animals in the barn and there is a uh, tradition of uh, women uh, with healing plants and when there was uh, when they didn't know how, what to do that's how it was here they would go maybe to a herdsman somebody who herded cows or sheep all summer long who didn't have uh, something plugged in the ear, who was illiterate, couldn't read. What does he do? Uh, plays a, makes a flute, plays a little bit, but mostly focuses on the, on the animals, on the cows, cows where they eat. It's just like, oh, it's like loving. Uh, it's not, they don't rip or bite. They just mow with their tongue. And, uh, and if you go really deep into that, like your soul travels into that and you go into the so far into their digestion, which normally takes about 12 with normal food, 12 days before it is uh, the, 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 you know, that pie is made of basically four stomachs, uh, bringing up the cod and chewing it again. And what they are doing is they are meditating. They're, they're meditating the food and they're meditating what the sun and the earth have put into this plant. And this is then released as a wonderful energy. Uh, the uh, uh, cow pie is a communication with the land that's right there because uh, that's why biodynamics don't like food brought in like from uh, argentina or wherever but because there's a communication and then the energy is a life energy uh with good information goes into also the milk and so on so if you meditate so deep then you become part of their meditation when you're day after day with this cows and uh, then you know what a plant can do and you don't even have to study or be literate mm -hmm. and then if it really was bad they always ask the herdsman uh who was hmm. out there on the on the yeah what, the, what they call here the um pasture uh, pasture yeah on the on the mountains here where i live the cattle come up uh end of may and leave uh in september and they live up here when, and that is possible because our soul can travel and soul is not uh, the chemistry of the brain and synapses, but the soul can travel. And that's why the Indians, uh, Cheyenne said, oh, don't sit too long at this uh, brook because your soul can travel and might take a while until he finds back to you again. Oh, and they even wow. have uh, medicine people to search for souls that have gone too far out and, wow. and come back. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's what happens uh, in the uh, working in the garden or I knew 
uh, Swiss peasants that plowed with horses and some still with oxen. They were in deep meditation together with the horses and they, the meditation, they could uh, smell what the soil smells like. It's totally different than in a cabin and you have Walkman or something on the ears and, and try to, uh, and the football games coming on. I still have to. Uh, yeah, the you know, tractor is like set, its course is set. You don't even have to think about driving it. It's just like a road. Yeah, that's how it is. And uh, no, it, uh, these is this old man in the uh, from the Ura Mountains. He said the best peasants, the best farmers, were those who had oxen because they uh, they go slow and uh, they can take up with the senses of the soul. They can, mm, they smell what's happening and they see the soil how it looks and they are in tune with the oxen that kind of himself in deep meditation just pulls that plow. Uh, these are faculties that we are, uh, many of us are losing and throughout the world with the techni uh, yeah, technology, new technology. Uh, I mean, I'm not against new technology, okay, but uh, uh, what is getting lost is this, uh, Mm, the power of the soul yeah, the, yeah yeah it's cutting off our our inherent power and yeah 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 and this power is not yeah this power is not comes not from our ego but it comes from just being egoless and so that the nature the plants the soil can talk to us yeah. and the ego puts concepts in and blocks it oh well that's uh you know, that's blah, 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 and it's just a mental process. And I find that is a really it's heavy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So before we uh, let you go, I, th I think it would be great to talk a little bit about um, your, I think it's your most recent book in English, um, where you talk about the Stone Age uh, uh, survivals into modern day, well, even Europe and North America, or the herbalism and how that's all connected from way back. I mean, like if the the Native Americans are doing this, using elder for the same things that the Europeans are, it has to go back to 20,000 years ago, basically, right? Yeah, uh, which book is that? I, I... That's the uh, the history of- um, Of uh, word cunning. Yeah, the, his, the, the untold history of, of healing and then also- oh, the, okay. Or why, of wise women and work cunners. Right, think right, right. Those are books yeah. that- Okay, yeah. our listeners. Will be That's uh, it is so. What you learn in school that everything started somewhere in Egypt or uh, Palestine or with the Sumerians, and also our um, healing started then. I mean, that's what you learn, and then it went to Greece uh, with Hippocrates and Esculap, and then to Rome. Uh, with Galen, and then came the wild barbarians, illiterate, uh, who burned down Rome and had no respect for libraries. And uh, and then a few monks uh, they, in their cloister cells, they, they, they kept some of this alive, and, and then it developed again and became our modern medicine. Well, that's, uh, that's ideological. Every, as an anthropologist, I can say every culture has its healing uh, that is effective and that is tuned in to what uh, sicknesses there are locally, and not what is happening in India or somewhere, but uh, local problems. And uh, this healing goes, the wisdom, the knowledge goes back uh, continually to the old Stone Age, mostly carried by the women folk. And uh, it, there are ethnobotanical studies. You know, the uh, American Indians came from Siberia back in, yeah, 20,000, 15,000 years ago. There was a land bridge. It was not a small bridge, but it was a about as wide as France is wide as a huge bridge and uh, mammoths went to mammoth elephants went to the new world the wolves went there. Uh, the buffalo or originally came from the old world and the elk 
also. And of course, the predators, the predators followed him, the wolves and the uh, the uh, Stone Age uh, 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 hunters. Yeah. With their teepees. They brought their teepees. Right. They didn't just walk over there. They had their teepees. They had their their round drums for shamanic drums and they had their healing uh and their knowledge of herbs because that was mainly the healing uh was um uh sweat baths and herbs and uh ethnobotanists have were able to show that the Amer north american indians use the plants preferably that they had already used 20,000 years ago in Siberia. And, uh, and if it didn't grow in the new world, then they used similar plants. Mm. Very important for all shamanic uh, rituals was smudging with uh, Artemisia vulgaris, that's mugwort. And in the new world, there was no mugwort, there was American mugwort, and that is uh, badly translated as prairie sage prairie sage about 75 percent of the rituals that are associated with prairie sage are the same as for mugwort in the old world uh, uh, so there is a continuity that ethnobotanically we can trace back with many plants and their usage uh, for at least 20,000 years yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that is. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those those books, we'll put them in the show notes, but um, the history of the untold history of healing and the herbal lore of wise women and work hunters, I think will be especially interesting for our listeners, uh, too, in addition to uh, horticulture and horticulture. Um, but uh, before we wrap it up, is there uh, anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners or visions for the future or yeah, it, what you're excited about? Yeah, as a, what I would say is um, we are children of the earth. We are children of heaven and earth. We are part of nature. We're not uh, aliens to nature. And in order to mentally and physically become well again, healed uh, well, uh, then uh, it is very good always to connect with nature. Even if you're living in a city, uh, you can take lunchtime, go out, smell a little daisy or something, feel the sun, uh, do it deliberately. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, my dog just came in too. I don't know if he's... Ah, yeah, it was like synchronized dogging. <laughs> yeah, synchronized dogging, exactly. <laughs> wow, wonderful. Ah, I had a dog like that. Uh, oh, yeah, I love dogs. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Sorry, we just, we've just got distracted from... Yeah, yeah being connected... Oh. Realize. Dogs are very, very important in this uh, in this quest also, because yeah. they bring you out. I mean, the people have to go out with their dogs, and dogs bring a life, life joy. And dogs, uh, their senses are so fine, mm. and they lend us their senses. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think dogs, animals, anyway. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Oh, here's. Oh, yay! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what a sweetie. Is it a puppy? Yeah. Yeah, it's a puppy. I love you. He's... He has to go to his new owners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So sweet. Oh, look at the puppy. Oh, Well, uh, well, this has been a really a wonderful um wonderful conversation i'm really uh excited honored that you you know were on the show yeah. and thank you so much well you you're great people too i i get the vibes Aww. coming across and uh wow <laughs> you're doing good work oh thank, thank you. you important work yeah thank you all of you too yeah and really, yeah 
is there um, a place that folks can learn more about you and find you on the interwebs? Uh, Ingo, do we have a pretty uh, an English? I mean, an uh, uh, internet uh, page? Not anymore. Oh. Uh, well, well, there's we, yeah. There's your your one in in German, which I was able to kind of like go through yeah. and figure out and see what you have as offerings and things, even though it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, lots yeah. of images. And then there's your author pages as well. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and there's Wikipedia articles. There's all that too. Yeah, the thing is, uh, if I lived in the states, I'd you know be doing a lot more, but. Of uh, my yeah, my karma is you know I hadn't planned it. Yeah, <laughs> my karma is to work here. It is I mean, people here need a little development aid too. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's great work. Well, um, thank you again, Wolf, very much, and we hope yeah. you enjoy the rest of your day.